my background is internal medicine, I'm a clinical immunologist, and one of my friends working in a psychiatry hospital in the 1990s, he told me he saw lots of his psychiatric patients where he looked after for, for internal medicine problems. He said, they have thyroid autoimmunity, and I was a thyroid autoimmune specialist, a di type 1 diabetes specialist. I, I was interested in endocrine autoimmune diseases and how do they come. So I was interested in autoimmunity. And then we did these studies and we published a, 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 on this. You, you will find a publication list. And we found three times more prevalent thyroid autoimmune disease, type 1 diabetes, in psychiatric patients, in mood disorder patients. And since then, other people have confirmed that, but the most um, nice studies have actually been done in Scandinavia, where you have these reg registries where they, you can do that nationwide. And indeed, psychiatric diseases are not only diseases of the brain. You see quite common all sorts of autoimmunities, as well as a much higher chance on infection. And since I was interested in how does an, an autoimmune disease come about, what is wrong with it, what are the defects, I started to think, oh, well, are there parallels with psychiatric diseases? And is there a common inborn background? Well, after that, of course, there was the era of the genetics. And what, what did we learn actually from GWA studies? Well, they were frightfully expensive. This is point number one, and actually they haven't delivered much for psychiatry. But what they, sh what they showed was, um, first of all, that you needed very large samples to get any data, so the, 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 involvement, the involvement of many genes are there in psychiatric diseases, and they all have a very low relative risk. The genes implicated are a, are a number of genes, but uh, on the synapses and histone pathways, but most importantly, and uh, also immune genes. So this, this set people to think, uh, let's say about 10 years ago. And the genes found in mood disorders, schizophrenia and autism spectrum disorders were overlapping. So people start to think, are, this, is, are there real distinctions between mood disorders, schizophrenia, autism spectrum disorders, or do they have a common background? And the other thing is, that immune genes found in psychiatry overlap with those with autoimmunity. So, people, so about five years ago, also the gene field started to be convinced that there might be something true in a hypothesis put forward in the 1990s, and that was the immune inflammatory theory of psychiatric disorders. And that stated that actually um, microglia, macrophage abnormalities, and T cell abnormalities were, were underlying psychiatric diseases. I'll have this here in this cartoon, actually, on the upper panel, where um, it is here that abnormal monocytes, abnormal T cells impact the brain, probably via cytokines and growth factors and impact the brain in such a way that a vulnerable brain starts to exist, where stress can easily elicit all sorts of mood symptoms or other psychiatric diseases. And here's depicted then the mood disorders. What is important to know, and I think this is a paradigm switch, if you t take an immunology book, you immediately see the cells discussed, the monocytes, the macrophages, and the T cells, but it immediately starts with infection, danger, and we purely have our immune system in immunology textbooks for combating infections. And I think that is totally wrong. It's not solely. This is only seldomly happening that a bacteria or virus really penetrates us. In the textbook, one says that actually macrophages in the tissues, T cells, CD8 cells, whatever you have, and K cells in the tissues are waiting for this to happen. But this is not true. It's an immune system in steady state, like the macrophages, the microglia in the brain, the macrophages in your thyroid, the dendritic cells around the islets of Langerhans, they are all involved, and the macrophages, for instance, in your ovaries, they are all involved in endocrine regulation and growth regulations of these glands. There are numerous papers of that. And this is the normal function 
of the immune system. Only when it is triggered by outside danger signals via the TLRs, they change their status and become inflammatory. So this starts to mean something. You have, first of all, you need your immune system for a proper brain function, proper eyelid function, proper thyroid function, proper bone function, proper liver function, and to develop. And then later on, you can use it also when you have an infection to combat the infection. This must change in the immunology textbooks. So this also puts the inflammatory theory of psychiatric disease at a certain point. It means that inflammation, yes, might be bad for your brain, but not because the inflammation is bad, but you neglect the other function. A combat soldier, we sent our troops to Afghanistan, Dutch soldiers. We thought they were building, going to build schools and bridges and so on. They had a peaceful function. But they couldn't do it because they had to fight the Taliban. It's exactly with the macrophages. They normally support your tissues, but if they have to fight, they neglect the other function. So you have to start differently that not only destruction is important, but the neglect of building up is important. So with this in mind, we started about eight years ago the first immune, uh, EU project called Moot in Flame. And, and, here, and we wanted to test and see and, and, um, and investigate the various components of the immune system in patients with psychiatric diseases. So this is the runner-up is the Psychate, and now I'm, we are funded f f in mood certification. There are many clinical groups and animal groups, but here you see we have made an enormous collection of patients, patients' material and patient data on major depression in the different stages, on bipolar disorder, different ages and different stages, on offspring of people of, of bipolar parents who went on to develop bipolar disorder, postpartum psychosis and postpartum depression, schizophrenia, and lots and lots of controls, which were age and gender mixed. You see many laboratories were, uh, were involved and also little companies and are still involved to make finally clinical applicable tests to be able to diagnose maybe the background of psychiatric disease. So these are the, this just a few pictures. I, I cannot thank everybody. There, there are actually 100 people involved in this project. So what are we going to do? Here you see we have groups which collect patients, many of the clinical groups, and I said already which patient groups were uh, investigated. Then most importantly, we, we tested in the blood the various type of cells, and I dwell a little bit first on this. We, and you have to go and in, the, in my literature to see how we do it, but we identified um, gene signatures in monocytes. We have, so if, when you talk about inflammation, inflammation as such does not exist. There are different types of inflammation. A monocyte or macrophage can have different states. You will know already the M1, the M2, but we know now M2B, M2C. Actually, the inflammatory stages, we identify three of them. One is really with IL-1 beta, IL-6, and TNF. Another is for motility factors, and another one is where we just dwelt upon the interferon signature, only interferon related molecules are up. So it's, it's quite flexible, and so inflammation as such does not exist. You do find it in different patterns. And I will only go later on to the cluster one, which is really the pattern where you have COX-2 in, COX-2 uh, of PDG, PDGS high, IL-1 beta high, TNF high. So this is first, uh, the first thing. And we do that with gene arrays. We test the gene arrays on the monocytes and then you see here, for instance, the cluster one, which actually consists of all these molecules. This is cluster two, and cluster, the interferon cluster is not there. But I hope you have an impression how we do it. Then we did lots of cytokines, and not only cytokines. We find also hematopoietic growth factors, very important, and neuronal growth factors. And often they are overlapping. So a stem cell factor is an important factor. I'll come back to that. It let leukocytes grow, but it let also neurons grow. 
Then the other, oh, excuse me. Then the other thing is we type by fax analysis the various types of circulating leukocytes, being it lymphocytes, monocytes, and K cells, but also Th1, Th2, Th17, and T regulatory cells. I'll come back to that because particularly in these latter populations, we can make distinctions for mood disorder and schizophrenia. And K cells are also important, but the other ones are less important. So we'll focus on the Th1, Th2, Th17, and T regulatory cells. Okay, then we also did some brain scans, new PET scans for the activation of the microglia, and also DTI measurements were mainly done in Milano for uh, the water flows and the connectivity between the forebrain and the hippocampus and, uh, and, and other structures in the brain, and correlated to a lot of things. We did tryptophan as well, but I will not go in detail here. So I cannot give you the data. You have to go to the literature. I'm publishing now on the mood in flame about 10 or 15 papers per year with other people. And so I'll try to give you now the state of the affairs. What happens? I do not believe, first of all, there is development. There is also development of the abnormalities. So the abnormalities are not the same when you are a child or a young adult with depression or an older female with depression and they will change over time. Like the whole immune system, also in healthy controls, we do find differences. When you grow older, your T regulatory cells go a little bit up, their function go a little bit down, and you become a little bit more inflammatory. This is normal aging. But it is completely different in the patients. So when you look at younger people with depression and you take out the ones who have been sexually abused, because this is a different group, also a different sick immune signature. I guess I'm, we haven't totally worked that out. But if we take them out, what you find under the age of 30 years is mild T cell defects. It means that there is a reduced naive T health, sometimes of the CD3, that's the total number of T cells, but particularly what I said in the CD4 T helper population, there are reduced naive T cells and increased memory cells. Then there is a reduced maturation of the Th2 and the Th17 cells, but a normal maturation of the T-Rex cells. So it is, in fact, and I come back to what, uh, previous, a little bit of the 20Q11 deletion syndrome. A little bit of it. Then when you grow older, above the 30 years, you see that people with a depression that it has become more pregnant, more worse. They have more clearly these abnormalities. The T memory cells are really higher. And what, what happens is that they also get a reduced number of T regulatory cells. And when you see that, the more the T regulatory cells are increased, the more inflammatory their monocytes are, the higher the cluster one expression. This is a perfect correlation, and we find it over and over again in three or four separate cohorts. So it means when you worsen and you also affect your T regulatory cells, inflammation gets a chance. So don't think that inflammation is always there. It depends really on your age and also the extent of your T regulatory cells. Then you have episodes of, micro, of, 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 in, of monocyte activation. And of course, I do not know what the reason is. Could easily be anything. You see, older people have lots of atherosclerosis, lipid profiles, whatever, but probably it's an exaggerated response to either to your microbes and so on. So this is the pattern which I think, on a genetic basis, you get your depression. When you have early on sexual abuse, you see the, the depression in our series, in our series of patients, is more repetitive early on, and they have strong inflammatory activation of their monocytes right away. I, I haven't been informed yet on their T cells. They're still in the fridge. Some have been worked out, and we are going to test them to see if they have T cell defects or not. I would assume perhaps not and this is a different form of depression. What about bipolars? We tested a group of bipolar children, and we know children of a bipolar parent, sorry, so they have a high 
genetic risk to become bipolar. We know it, that they do that, because we followed those kids, and about 70% turn out at, when they are 30 years of age with mood symptoms. So there's a strong um, familial risk for this. But we tested the kids when they were 16, 21, 28, and so on. So not all of them, certainly when they are 16, only a, a minority had mood disorders, but they had already strongly abnormal uh, immune function. They actually had the pattern which an older depressed person has, namely low naive T cells, high memory T cells, reduced maturation, reduced mat and, and a reduced maturation of T-Rex cells. They had a strong, very strong monocyte inflammatory activation, but this was in the entire group, and only few had psychiatric symptoms. There is a weak correlation between the monocyte inflammation and the chance to get it, but it's certainly not significant. But the children are not only at risk to get psychiatric disease, they have at higher risk also for thyroid autoimmunity, they get thyroid autoimmunity more worse. And what we actually found, the lower the T-Rex, the higher the possibility for a thyroid autoimmune disease. And they have higher infections. But what happens with these kids, which do not have the psychiatric symptoms yet, and certainly when they're 25 also not, you see that they start to restore it. Their growth factors, hematopoietic growth factors go up. They start to restore it. So the older depressed patients cannot probably restore it, or so they are too old for it, I don't know. But the younger bipolar patients, they start to restore it. And then finally, when you have a euthymic bipolar patient, when they come out with bipolar dis disorder, they have in fact, no low, this is the only sign, a little bit low CD3 cells, but they have increased maturation of the Th2 and Th17, and they have actually higher T regulatory cells only during episodes, because they do get episodes, they have the same T cell profile, but they have high inflammatory monocytes. I don't know why this happens, but this is the pattern. But it looks as though the bipolar is in, 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 in essence a major depressed patient, but with compensated abnormalities in his T cell defects. Right, did I? Yes. Uh, I'll skip this. So what I want to do is actually take you now with me and forget about psychiatry. Go with me and change. Become a clinical immunologist. The disease is not depression, is not schizophrenia, is not autism spectrum disorder, is not bipolar, it's T-cell deficiency. And the play in time and how you are able to restore it and what time it actually starts to happen, what impact it can have on the brain development and so on and influences of sexual abuse on this abnormal immune system will determine your symptoms in the end, being depressed, being manic. This is a symptom, it's not a disease. Depression is not a disease, it's a symptom. Mania is not a disease, it's a symptom of what happens with the immune system and then impacts brain development in such a way that you, you cannot handle stress or whatever. <coughs> so I like to say progressive CD4 TH3, this is the disease with late onset and this often goes with unipolar, de with depressive symptoms, not mania, repetitive infection and autoimmunity. You see, the chances to get the other ones are as high as the other one, it's, it's a sort of mild 20Q11 syndrome. And here when you'd compensate it, you, we, we say you are in a uh, bipolar situation. How long do I have? Six minutes. Okay. So if you think about that, you have to treat the patients, not only for their abnormalities in the brain, you have to treat them in particular for the immune defects or the immune. No one has ever tried now T cell app to, to correct the T cells. To, in, my, in my opinion, it's also very difficult. Only a bone marrow transplantation can do that. 
to be honest, but, but perhaps IL-2 therapy, we will hear about it, or other therapies are capable of doing it. Um, by the way, there are reports that autism was for a large part cured by a bone marrow transplantation. Um, but let's, I've, I've, told you, I've told you low grade inflammation can be there or not there depending on the situation. So let's try and focus on that and we have to see, of course, uh, does it work? And anti-inflammatory agents. In our group in Mutin, Mutin Flame was uh, the group from München, um, from Norbert Müller, and he had a lot of experience with the COX-2 inhibitors, so we, we decided to go ahead with the COX-2 inhibitors. So this is the Munich Mutin Flame study, it hasn't been published yet, we are busy doing it. And so previous studies already from his group, but also other groups indicated that the addition of celecoxib, a COX-2 inhibitor to sertraline or an SSRI gave a better outcome. Oh, excuse me, there are two meta-analyses uh, done. You can read about it here, Farid Tulsani and Naito, that it, it, it is better when you take the, the patients all together. So our aim was to investigate of a specific and the the specific immune profiles of MDD, what you saw, the CD40 helper defects and the inflammatory gene expression predicts immune responsiveness. Can we make it better by doing, sending the patient first to the laboratory, take his blood and say, well, you have this, so now you should have your celecoxib. So this is the group. Unfortunately, we have uh, not been able to include many patients, only 42. And they were very special. This was an inclusion criterion. They had a very severe depression, in fact. As you see, the washout period we needed to do only in three or three days. So they actually were referred to the clinic from outside having not have had an, an antidepressant, but immediately sent to the clinic and they had on average two episodes before. So you see. And the ones which were really therapy resistant were not included in the trial. They immediately went on to other treatments. So this is, in essence, a little bit a description of the group. And in both arms, uh, there are the same patients included. So what are the outcomes? Well, we marginally found a good effect in the entire group of the celecoxib. This is the 50% 50, uh, 50 response rate, which means the number of patients responding or not responding to the therapy with a 50% reduction in HAMD score. This is normal done. As you can see, the celecoxib group did it a little bit better, but this was not significant. P is 0 0.01, uh, 0, 01, so it's, it's not significant, but hoovering at the brink, you can say. But when you take the 60%, it is significant, 70% not. So you see it is a little bit higher and fiddling around with some statistics, you can say it's significant, but of course this is just hoovering at the brink. Then the non-responders, you see, they do have a higher, so response to sertraline alone is, is, uh, is mediated a little bit, of, is heralded by the inflammatory state. Well, we are not the only, the first ones to say that. Here you see the same ones who didn't respond to sertraline alone with this inflammatory response. They do when you add COX-2 inhibitors. And a small group did not respond to the combination and they had the highest inflammation level in their monocytes. So you see clearly that there is some prediction possibility. All the other parameters I will not show, but the other one is the level of the naive T helper cell. I said it is a defective situation. As you can see, the group not responding to the double therapy had the lowest T cell defects. So they had the highest inflammation and the lowest. So they start to approach the, the 20 Q11 deletion syndrome without having the genes for it. So it's, well, I hope you appreciate that. But more importantly, but the study is a little bit, is underpowered, is the following. If we now make the stratification on the basis of the naive T cells 
and the inflammatory response. And we, we have patients only in, for three, we couldn't do it because we didn't have the full house of, of laboratory uh, uh, outcomes. But here you can see, this is too little a group, but we had three patients which had no inflammation whatsoever. So had the negative score of the score zero. None of the key genes were raised. They all responded to sertraline. I know from another trial I did with Zenda vaccine that we find the same. So it does look, if you measure the inflammatory response of the monocytes and there is no response, the patient will respond to surgery. Also, these patients were all below 30 years. So they had the lowest age. Maybe the clinicians know that, that young people might respond better to surgery alone than the older ones. Then when you look, this is the last slide, when you look at those with mild scores and higher scores but without, with normal naive T cells, they virtually all respond to the COX-2, over 90%. And only in this little subgroup left with the most severe abnormalities, they do not respond to both. And I guess they might need anti-TNF, something stronger, or upgrading of with to lithium or whatever known, but this we haven't tested. So, although under power, this study indicates that add-on immune therapy guided by immune cell stratification is, in my view, the way forward to reach around 90% and even higher responsiveness in immune-selected groups. So the take-home message is, is that I believe that inborn CD4T helper cell defects can be a cause of a lot of mood disorders, a large proportion, and probably also of bipolar disorder, and so on. And that this gives new therapeutic options and immune stratification for personalized medicine in the clinic. You as a psychiatrist, maybe in 10 years' time, send the patient first to the immune laboratory, you get your decisions there meet. And the data strengthen in general the view that I believe there is a balancing homeostatic immune endocrine neural network in all of us, operative at this moment to guide us to a healthy, safe life. And this, this, this system also safe of, of guides our mental health. And an imbalance in this network, be it due to inborn defects, might lead not only to immune diseases, as we know already, but also to mood disorders and other psychiatric symptoms in situations of danger. Thank you.